All right. Uh, I guess we're, that sounds a little good. Uh, okay, I think we're ready to get going. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to the 167th monthly meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Uh, tonight, we are going to be hearing from Hans Christoph Steiner and Lydia Zarello uh, about a very exciting mobile project called the Guardian Project. Um, the uh, blurb from the meetup page today is uh, as follows. I think it's really interesting. Um, while smartphones have been heralded as the coming of the next generation of communications and collaboration, they are a step backwards when it comes to personal security, anonymity, and privacy. The Guardian project aims to create easy-to-use apps, open-source software libraries, and operating system modifications, and customized mobile devices that can be used and deployed around the world by any person looking to protect their communications and personal data from unjust intrusion and monitoring. So, Tonight, before we get started, we have three quick requests. First is please silence your cell phones. The second is please do not use the coffee maker or any of the coffee apparatus back there. They're incredibly noisy. And uh, third is if you have a question, uh, feel free to uh, ask, uh, raise your hands while the uh, uh, presenters are speaking. But I'm going to come over with the mic and make it so that hopefully everyone can hear you. Um, we'd also like to quickly thank Google for graciously allowing us to use this great space. Uh, I'd like to thank our other sponsors, IBM, Canonical, Brand Door Group, and O'Reilly Media for their continued support. Um, in addition, Nyla would not be able to function without our many volunteers who have contributed greatly over the years. Um, after the meeting, we encourage folks to join us for more talks and drinks at McKenna's Pub at 250 West 14th Street. We'll have a couple of groups heading over, so um, don't worry, we'll to run out. Um, We'll make sure everyone gets there and wants to go. Um, so uh, we have a reservation in the back area. The radio will be a little lower, so we'll have uh, an environment for talking and catching up. Um, a few quick announcements. Uh, first, next month, we will be hearing from Paul uh, Chizano about functional programming with Scala. And please check out meetup.com for more information and to register. Uh, our next workshop will be on uh, Tuesday, April 23rd, right? Um, please find Rob Mendez, David Bristow, or James Melbourne if you have any questions about the workshops. They're here, there, and over there. And there are many CDs to pick up if you're interested in trying one out, or you haven't burned one recently, and you were thinking of experimenting, please check out the back table. Does anyone have any additional announcements? Oh, all right. Well, please welcome our presenters, Hans Christoph Steiner and Lee Ezra.
we, we, try, we, we try to be as transparent with our, our funding sources as possible as well. Um, um, you know, that obviously requires some collaboration on both sides. Um, but, uh, um, you know, so a lot of the core team um, has a specific kind of project-based timelines that we're working, uh, we're, uh, we're building the Guardian tools as a larger open source project with these specific kind of arrangements. Right. Yeah, so we're funded everything um, from uh, state to various state department ent entities like the Board of Broadcast Governors, um, a, a NGOs like uh, Witness, based here in Brooklyn, DRL. Free, Press, Free Press DRL is the State Department, um, Free Press Unlimited, which is a, I believe a Dutch nonprofit NGO. Um, we've actually gotten money from Google. Uh, which actually was really important for getting us started. They just pretty much wrote us a check and said, good work. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, and then I think, yeah, I think pretty much now all of our funders we are now public, but sometimes because of the process of getting grants and things like that, in contracts, we can't be public about the process until it's done. So we try and push that as much as possible, but it's not always um, so now, uh, what we're addressing. Um, a lot of people use mobile phones everywhere. And it's, it's interesting, from a, a, particularly from a free software perspective, um, because Android is Linux, and, uh, and you can run Linux on Android, or you, know, you can do all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and. Uh, uh, the the larger like international open source community uh, is uh, not not as active as I personally would like to, in, in the mobile space and how you know the computer like, uh, what is called a computer is changing so rapidly um, and you know the the more sort of what what is now uh, considered like traditional platforms. Um, Laptop computers and server, laptop computers and servers. Um, a lot of end users are migrating to these new platforms, and they're they're new. Um, so there's still all this kind of, you know, figuring out of like what we can do with it, and uh, also engaging in the larger open source community. Um, that is still in progress. Um, but one of the things that we we started out doing actually we did, we've done some work on BlackBerry and Symbian, but um, we pretty much now are. 95% focused on Android, maybe 9%. Um, yeah, because so the, there's that, I, I just, uh, co uh, we collaborate with iOS as well. Right, we have some iOS projects, but we we really decided to kind of bet the farm on Android because first it was open source, so we could mess with it, we could uh, audit it, we could customize it, we could tap into what all the other people are doing, um, and and that's uh, actually uh, prov uh, proven to be very important to a lot of the stuff we do. The guts um, of Android. Uh, then, um, uh, uh, another, oh yes, the other key part of Android is that it's running on so many devices. So, uh, iOS is very nice, but it's not, it still remains relatively expensive. And there is not really this big drive to spread wide adoption. An Apple's strategy is. They're going to take the high end of the market. Um, and so we really want to provide tools that anyone all over the world can use. So affordability is really a key aspect. So we, we regularly, a lot of our members are traveling, so we regularly uh, are picking up all sorts of uh, devices from all over the world. And uh, you can get, uh, Nathan, uh, the founder, was just in Thailand, and uh, where there's a, um, stores of brands you've probably never heard of, like Igo and Inol. Um, the unfortunately named Ion and OL. And you can get a fifty dollar little tablet there running Android. You can get, you know, there's now like thirty dollar phones running Android. So, and then you also have the high end, um, all covered on this same platform. So this makes it really interesting. Yeah, it's it's really amazing um, uh, the 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 diversity of the hardware platforms out there, um, and even some some of the um, some of the Chinese phones. Um, um, first of all, none of them are carrier locked, um, and uh, some of the there's all these there's all these cool like um, like kind of hardware hacker communities um, 
uh, that, that will make like these sort of one-off custom phones and stuff, and a lot of them have like four SIM slots, because you just get a whole bunch of SIM cards and just stack them in there, and whichever one works, like, go for it. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's interesting, and it's, and, but these, these, these weird things are like fully-fledged computers. Um, so, next up, we've been talking about how we work as an open source project. Um, the core group of us, most of us, are really kind of technology focused, but we're addressing problems uh, that affect people all over the world. Um, and so, the way we try and drive our development is to partner with organizations that have direct real world experience, uh, hopefully, training capabilities and things like that, um, so that we can be working on real world problems with people who understand um, how we're going to get the software into people's hands and, and what the actual thing, understand in depth about the problems that we're trying to address, we can bring a deep understanding of the technical side and we think this process makes a lot better uh, software. And what are those problems? <laughs> so, I, I, it depends on, I guess, where people have heard of us from but I think we have something of a reputation of addressing problems over there. Um, but really, we want to. We think that these issues affect everyone all over the world, anyone who uses a mobile phone, anyone who uses the internet. Um, and the problems and uh, solutions are different depending on where you are, but we do want to, um, to address what privacy and anonymity for everyone in this room, for everyone in this country, for everyone in the world. Uh, one, one of my uh, uh, my favorite quotable uh, lines from a, a, a friend and colleague named Jake, Jake Alcon, who works with the Tor Project, um, and uh, he talks about Tor a lot. Um, Guardian Projects uh, is uh, um, has has a lot of overlap with Tor, um, and we're, we kind of op we operate independently. Uh, but uh, Jake Jake described Tor as uh, um, a network like software that ensures your right to read. And it's, it's very abstract, but it's also kind of true. And, and it's, I think we're kind of operating in a space where um, a lot of our specific use cases um, involve like, free, like freedom of expression or freedom of communications, yeah. which are uh, uh, kind of characteristically American uh, views. Um, and other, there are other like, part, parts of the world that do not share that. Is like you know, freedom of expression is a human right. Um, so while we are not focusing, we're not partnering with the business world, um, we, uh, we're finding you know, people uh, in the business world using these tools because people need secure communication. Um, where we got our start was working with activists and, and, um, and now people are saying citizens, uh, citizen journalists. Um, and here, this is a situation where we're really focusing on uh, affordability and ease of use, and, and um, uh, it's where this is a, so uh, here we really have to look at issues of uh, how people are being tracked. Um, there's a lot of countries in the world that um, have very, very strong centralized monitoring, and they act on it. Maybe. So things like they see someone using encryption that's not standard, so they are and they actually go and pay you a visit. So, or you, they, they have one big server where everybody's text messages go through and they have uh, analytic systems going through everybody's text message where what you say could also give you a visit from the security service. Yeah. And, in, and, and le less drastically, but still, uh, still uh, equally annoying, uh, just denial of service completely. Not like DDoS style, but just like, like protocol detection. Like there are, there, there are there are um, parts of the world uh, where, like, vo like void. If you do sip over port fifty sixty, it will be blocked. Um, and, you know, yeah, there, there's there's other projects like that in our larger kind of community that are. Uh, and there's a great one called Uni that's trying to map censorship uh, all over the internet. So then there's people working for human rights NGOs who need who are going to be talking uh, to people with information, but they have the. Um, ability to leave that country and bring and shuttle information to this different set of risks. Um, and this is like witness the group we with, they really uh, focus on this kind of uh, work. Um, we're also uh, 
when you're doing election monitoring, you need a way to securely communicate. You also need a way to um, transmit data that can be um, that you can verify that it has not been modified. This is another aspect that we work on. Uh, how, how to make uh, cell phone apps transmit data to somewhere else and, and then have a verifiable chain of custody um, so that you know that this is the same file that the person sent. Um, and some of our early adopters and kind of power users have been uh, reporters all over the world. Um, it's a similar kind of thing um, as uh, uh, human rights defenders, where they, they're, they're going to be talking to people. So they're not necessarily in the great risk themselves, but they're going to be talking to people and getting information from people, which if it was given, you know, leaked out to the wrong people, would get that, that person in a lot of trouble. Um, and so who followed these things? Yeah, and was it, who followed the Vice talking to John McAfee um, picture? Does this ring a bell for anyone? <clears throat> Basically, John McAfee was on the run from Belize, where he lived. He uh, is kind of loves being in the media, so some vice reporters met with him secretly um, in the undisclosed location, took a picture, posted on their website, but little did they know, most cameras these days automatically put the GPS information in the picture. They posted this picture on the website, and it, everyone then could see exactly where John McAfee was hiding, like, you know, within 50 meters. <laughs> Maybe less. Uh, so a lot of reporters aren't really aware of, of, of this kind of stuff, so that's part of what we try and do is, is build awareness. And the, yeah, the, 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 the journalist uh, use case is, is, a, a, is, is also interesting, um, uh, especially in these frontline situations, because these are people that um, uh, they're traveling a lot, um, they most likely will be polyglots, and they have all sorts of crazy devices, and it's not really about like, uh, developing like, like an exclusive like trust phone thing that's like this hardware product, and it's more about um, uh, being able to give like application level stuff uh, that that they can communicate with the people they need to that might not care about like using like cool hacker tools, um, but um, the um, you know being able to support to have, have sort of establish a set of best practices with functional software as proof. Yeah. So. In that show, we're trying to provide <laughs> security uh, as much as is possible, um, and always balancing the trade-off of um, making it still something that, that people can actually use. And, and, and um, on on the, the just the mobile level in general, it gets a lot. Mo mobile mobile phones or smartphones or whatever computer handsets. I don't know what to call them anymore. Um, but they uh, um, they get a bad rap. There's some there's a news news article I forget who published it. But it was like a couple weeks ago. It was, it was like here here's the reason why your mobile phone is is better at identifying you than your than your fingerprint. Um, so it's, it's kind of like there, there's there's a lot of panic in the space of the mobile phones. OMG. But um, we're we're uh, our approach is that we're making these platform agnostic tools. That uh, like they they they're they're not solving these giant big picture problems, but they're taking on these smaller problems and starting the momentum of um, a, a larger discussion, which is mobile phone security through you know the open source community and the hacker community and human rights and journalists. Um, you know that discussion is is happening, and it's not just oh no panic. We're like well when you're done panicking. You could use GTOC security in your path, for example. Yeah, so it's going to... Sorry, I'm going to go. We're going to flip through the slides because, uh, because we totally practice. So, to start with, just some of the tools that we actually... Do, just, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. But um, what we got to start, and it's kind of our, one of our core bits, is Warbot. Um, this provides Tor and amenity services on your phone. It's in the App Store. You can all download it now. Um, it's free, you know, it uh, and it allows um, you to use any kind of internet service without anyone in the middle to be able to tell what you're using. So it anonymizes <coughs> what you're doing to your phone to anyone in the, who can view the network. Um, and it was the uh, um, it, it Orbot was the it was the first uh, Tor client uh, for I think any mobile. 
penny. And it has this kind of, well, actually what it's become better known for these days, um, the structure of it actually makes it a really good circumvention tool. So when people try and, um, like the Great Wall, <coughs> Firewall of China is a great example, they're trying to uh, actively block all sorts of things, things in the New York Times, uh, various Google services. Um, but Orbot, because it's this like multi, it's a basically like a chain of VPNs, uh, it actually works pretty well at getting around uh, a lot of this kind of centralized blocking. Fortunately, China is really good at tracking stuff, so it's hard to use Tor in China. But it's other places it works. <laughs> it also has a cool side effect um, uh, of um, if you're on an open Wi-Fi network um, and you're, you're not down with that Wi-Fi network uh, um, in like kind of a trusting way, but you still want to use the internet, um, uh, since uh, it, if you, uh, one of the ways of configuring Tor on uh, an Android phone, um, uh, which is optional, um, but it, uh, it's, if you have root on your phone, you can transparently proxy all of your network data. Um, just like right now, uh, I started it in, in transparent proxy mode, so any any internet connection over any radio on this thing um, is going with Tor. Um, so for in the case of open Wi-Fi, it, it kind of encrypts you know that first hop um, as, as a side effect. It's not, that wasn't really the, like a design intention, but it's kind of cool, um, so you can know that like. Someone within radio scanning distance is like jacking all of your uh, your data. So then we have Jibberbot, which is a, a basically an IM app, but we're trying to structure it more and more. Like a lot of these popular apps, like that are uh, SMS replacement things, like WhatsApp, Line. Um, uh, but there's so many. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, the difference with this one is that it's uh, it has end-to-end -end encryption. It can use Tor, so that you don't have to trust the server in the middle. Um, because you are encrypting in the client, and only the other side of the conversation can decrypt it. So no one in the middle can read your messages. Um, you don't have to trust the server in that sense. Um, and then the other side is using Tor, so um, someone can't tell that you're, if they're monitoring the network, they can't tell um, what, whether you're using IAM or web traffic or whatever. Yeah, like, like right now, um, uh, it's uh, this, this, the browser I'm running on my phone thinks my IP address appears to be, you know, some IP address which is not here, um, and that's because the Tor, Tor network has this giant infrastructure of um, um, of proxies and relays, um, and it's it's one way. So like, you know, it, it, talking about it as a function, like what you put in is what you get out. Um, so keep that in mind. Plain text in means plain text out. But while it's within the Tor network, uh, it is encrypted, and you also can't go backwards. So it's just this like big one-way global proxy thing. So we have um, Chat Secure is one. It's uh, started off by another group that we're, we we um, support them, uh, not contribute a little bit of code, uh, help, and also actually pay them to develop it. And that's on iOS. Um, another related one is it's a startup Griffin, but they actually are trying to make uh, <coughs> again a chat app, but they're trying to make it so you can send um, what's the picture deleting service. Snapchat. Snapchat. The exact kind of functionality where you can send an image to someone and tell it uh, t and have an expiration date. So you can say that they can only view this image for 10 seconds. Um, there's a bunch of apps that do this and claim that it's secure, but they're basically none of them are even close. Like you can take a screenshot, for example. Or some of them are actually just literally storing the images on in, on the phone, like writing them to disk. Uh, centralized. This one, so they've done uh, we work with them to make all the uh, storage encrypted, and and we tested their app and it, it managed to block screenshotting and things like that. There's still the analog hole; you can take a picture of your phone, but that's an important uh, yeah. well, not the not the analog part, but the but um, the, that's an important point that you just made about um, this and this idea, this idea of end-to-end -end encryption, um, and this this uh, a lot of the Guardian Project's approach. To, uh, to to app development um, is uh, is um, the the idea that like leveraging existing infrastructure and end to end encryption uh, so, uh, so like so being able to do something like use use Facebook chat or use Gchat um, as the infrastructure service because you know, regardless of your opinions on those particular companies um, they have a lot of infrastructure out there um, and. Okay. They're hella better at maintaining it than. Um, like, so we have TechSecure, which is uh, started by Whisper Systems. Um, 
it's now we were involved in the effort to, to get it open source and now open source, um, and we've been uh, contributing to it and getting it translated. Um, and it is end-to-end uh, -end encrypted text messaging. Um, so you still SMS through that. And then in a whole other world, um, if we work with media, so this started out with obscure cam. Uh, it's a camera app that lets you redact uh, regions. Yeah. Encrypted, so they can just see it's a big encrypted blob, but they don't know what's in it. 
Um, but once the say organization uh, like witness or in, if you have a case in the International Criminal Court, they want to have as much evidence as possible to tie uh, tie the video to the time, the place, the location, so they can build evidence about a particular case. Um, and then John McAfee is <laughs> Can you um, stream so that can you stream uh, to the recipient so that if the phone somehow ends up in the wrong hands while you're recording, then at least some of it is being able to be Yes, yeah, so that's part of the whole package is the trickle syncing. Um, and um, so it needs to, we're making a, kind of, it has a server side and a client side, and, and part of what we wanted to do is opportunistically, whenever it has any kind of internet connection, try to upload content if, if that's useful. Um, and we actually. Do you have a question? Sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. Have any streaming video services um, offered to support um, displaying the start along with the uh, stream? So it, this isn't really streaming, it's more like trickle upload. Oh, I, so. I mean, streaming would be nice, but it's, I mean, we did just get a, a big grant for this particular one from the Knight Foundation, <laughs> but that's like, I mean, we'd like to get there, we need a lot more money and people to do that level of, like, if we could partner with, like, Van Loser, they already have that, like, uh, be able to live stream and trickle and securely, like, yeah, that's, the, like, the end goal. Um, and I just want to actually come back to what Stego, so maybe Stego is probably not a term that a lot of people are familiar with. It basically means there's encryption, which is, no, this could be part <laughs> Encryption, which is um, converting data into something you just cannot read, but you can see it, see that it's present. It's easily detectable that there's encrypted data there. Steganography is hiding data, um, trying to like embed data into an image so that when you, you that uh, you can't detect that there's data embedded in the image. Um, it's much harder to do than encryption. And um, we are working as an app called Pixel Map that we're starting to put out there. It uses a second hour technique called F5, and this is where it allows you to encrypt a piece of data and then embed it, hide it in an image. Um, is that the same thing as Steg Droid? Steg Droid? Steg Droid is that the Chrome app? No, it's like in the Play Store. It's there, yeah, there, there's, a, if there's an app called Stake Droid. Stake Droid. It's, uh, it's very slow, and it doesn't work uh, okay. that well in my very small sample of test use cases. There's also a Chrome app that does the same method. I forget what it's called. Um, so, like, again, to the kind of grand Uber plan, you know, hopefully we could uh, have it so that we have all this encrypted metadata signed and everything, and then embedded in pictures. So that they're like, oh, look, you're just sending lots and lots of pictures of kittens. Uh, but actually, it's normal. Is there any concern that, say, the Chinese government can install malware that would sort of, without you knowing, submit photos you take to inform a cam directly to, like, the Chinese, you know, security service or something like that? Yeah, so, um, we're what? <laughs> Uh, that's one of the approaches we're taking, which is uh, all these um, apps. We're trying. We're making developer tools so that it's easy for Android apps to and store everything into per app encrypted containers. So that's one of the approaches. Um, so that. So on one hand, if you have malware that doesn't have root access, um, that's actually pretty easy to prevent because you can just use file permissions, and Android does a good job of that. Um, you, just, you just mark a uh, file as private in Android, and as long as the malware doesn't have root permission, it won't, really, it won't be able to get it. But then we also want to defend against malware that has root permission, so in this case we use these virtual encrypted disks, um, where you can have a, a key tied to the app. And so if that, your app, if the former cam is not running, the encrypted virtual disk is not unlocked. Um, and so even if you have root access, you don't have access to the data that's stored in this local container. So it's not, this is uh, something we're starting to roll out. This is something we put in the Griffin app. That's the first kind of, I guess it's in some of the farming camps. We have two, it's pretty new, so we, it hasn't been like really battle tested um, in terms of like 
whether like if the Chinese really want to break it, whether they can. You know, like, hopefully, someone will tell us when they break it, so that we can fix it. I encourage all of you to come and break all of Try and break everything. Like good citizens. And that, uh, that, that uh, correct me if I'm wrong, wrong moms, but that that, so that in particular library is called IO Cipher. Yeah, so yeah, IO Cipher is is the encrypted virtual disk, and SQL Cipher is, is an encrypted database. Is, um, so each on on the um, uh, on the Android platform, each uh, each app has access to a SQLite database as internal storage, um, and uh, SQL Cipher encrypts that SQLite database. We only really use that as we uh, hop up what we go into. Um, yeah. What I'm kind of the, like we mentioned, we kind of have area heads, and I mean, I'm kind of one of the one focused on developer tools. Um, well, we develop a lot of apps and a lot of different ideas, like Informicam and Tor, um, and this. And so what, once we kind of get an idea, once we get kind of working in it and think it's useful, we try and uh, turn them into developer tools. Uh, all, all free software and, and try and make it really as easy as possible for developers to include these into their own apps, whatever app they want, whatever they're doing. Um, so, this is what we're calling the Cypher Suite. Because um, uh, it started with SQL Cypher, which is like a project by a, a company called Synthetic, it's, um, which is a partner of ours. They um, took SQLite and um, the SQLite database, which is all open source, they modified it to have uh, in encryption, so you can have complete encryption, very uh, robust, and um, it's done kind of quite fine grained if you need it. Um, so, that it, they used it originally in some of their um, iOS apps. So, then we said, well, this is really useful. Um, but in order for people to include it in um, Android apps, uh, they're going to have to learn a whole new way of uh, working with the database or, and all this custom code. So we were just thinking about this is this is really no one's really going to do this because it's so hard to do. So we were thinking about well, what can we, how can we make this easier for developers? Like, what's the easiest way? Well, any Android developer is pretty used to the data. There's already an Android SQLite database API. So we said, well, why don't we just take that API? And actually, was, we actually just took the whole Android code, because it's, Android is based on SQLite as well. We ripped that out and turned it into a framework so that the only real difference between the regular Android database API and the uh, SQL software for Android API is that you have to give it a key to, to open the password and you, and you um, can uh, uh, change the password. Um, it's the same code. Uh, so, at this point, what we've seen, you know, people, if you, you have your app already built on the Android database API, just take our, our uh, library, plug it in yours, uh, change the import statement, so you just say, instead of importing android.database, you're importing, what is it, sequels, I forget what it is, net.sql cipher, You just get, you get tab, <laughs> dot, and get tab. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah, you just delete the imports, hit the, the button in the clips, and choose the right one. Um, and then some small mod modifications. Um, so this has worked out pretty well. Um, we actually haven't done a good job of tracking who's used it, who's using it. We know the biggest one is Salesforce, is Android app. <laughs> you cool. Not necessarily our target audience, but at least it's a nice stamp of approval. And, and that, that, that is one, one of the, uh, to sort of tangent, go off on a tangent, um, uh, one of the big challenges in running uh, or working with an organization that develops security tools is tracking who uses them. <laughs> yeah, we're going to conflict of interest there. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, we have a hard time reporting metrics because we're not totally tracking it. Um, so the next version of this, we, we wanted to store, well, we were working with camera apps, and we were like, well, we need a way to store um, images and video, uh, and storing them in a database was just kind of a nightmare. Um, so the same kind of approach, we're like, well, what, why don't we find some way to make it really easy file storage, what uh, API are Android developers used to seeing? Well, the java.io, regular, uh, however you do you file operations in Java. Um, so we did the same thing. We took the, the Android code, it's all open source, we, we ripped it out, we made a version based on SQL Cypher, because we, we, 
which is also then in turn based on this uh, library called SQL, uh, SQLFS, which makes a file system out of um, SQL, SQLite databases. Uh, so we have this whole chain. What you see is uh, you set up, um, it's very similar to the SQL stack with Android, you set up um, a file and you say this is my virtual disk. Uh, you give it a key to unlock it. Uh, and then you use, you change the import so that instead of using java.io.file, you're using info.guardianproject.io.cypher.file. And everything else is the same. Um, in any case, it seems like there's a lot of keys and sounds like there might be even a per app key that needs to get used for each one of these security enabled um, apps. Um, so, what's your key management strategy for all of this? Because it just seems like it's going to be a nightmare for a user to keep track of. Yeah, that's kind of, that's definitely, it's been a hard problem and um, luckily we're working on it right now. And we actually have something, uh, something that's quick alpha but ready for people to try um, called Cashword. So it's an Android server, password caching service that's meant to tie into all these um, things. And right now, I mean, our grand plan is to, is to be able to support, um, we want to have both uh, tie-ins to the screen lock, which we figured out, I forget how we did that exactly, but there was a way to, so that when you unlock your screen, um, yeah. it unlocks certain databases. But then also you can have a per app key um, where you're saying like, okay, this is so sensitive that I, I have to unlock it every single time and have that configurable. Because a lot of the stuff, most people, um, well, something like uh, <coughs> TechSecure is an example. Uh, okay, this doesn't have so there, uh, they have some um, password management. But basically, like if you had to type in your uh, passphrase every time you checked a test method, you'd probably go nuts. So most people wouldn't use it, and that would be horrible. So there are certain people who uh, are, would be at high enough risk that they want to be have to, they want to be forced to type in the password every time they do a text message. That's not a lot of people. <laughs> Most people, it'd be great if just, you know, a cache for an hour, for maybe a day, that kind of thing. So we're working on supporting that kind of model so you can have somewhat adjustable uh, levels of security so that it doesn't just become a pain in the ass and no one uses it. <laughs> yeah? Uh, so I was curious with that. Is there an option to explicitly like just forget everything? Say you're going into like some sketchy area and you know I want to delete all of these apps things now. Hold the battery. <laughs> oh, you, you mean wipe everything? Yeah, wipe all. Uh, um, that's batteries. something we, we started off early on, and it's like a lot of promise, but we the funder kind of exploded. And is so it, it's, it's now called in the clear. Um, it's pretty raw. Like if you do some things like wipe your desk book. Um, but that's also something we, uh, we're definitely kicking around trying to start up again, because um, it's really important. Um, it's not just trying to do it. There's, yeah. a, there's, there's a lot of these, um, these efforts to, to have some kind of like, uh, well, it's, it's, not, it's not a generic framework, though, but it, that would be a cool goal, but it's sort of a weird, like each use case for this, for like, for like panic button stuff, um, is very specific, so it's not really a generic problem. Everyone is kind of looking for their own solution. Mm -hmm. Like there was one that, that, that I recently heard about, where like the feature, the the main feature is that it turns into a calculator app. So it just <laughs> looks like a calculator, and then you, you like do do it looks like you're just using the calculator, but you're actually like unlocking fun, mm -hmm. the the panic button thing, um, which is like you know very very niche. <laughs> I mean that's something that we it's definitely important. It's something we want to work on. We don't really have funding for it. It's, and also, we just like we don't have enough people, um, developers, basically. Uh, it's, it's a common problem. But um, we have so we have there's like bits and pieces. So if there's anyone who really wants to work on this stuff, we have bits and pieces, and we're also like we're incorporating in some of our apps. But we're and we're just trying to talk about like how can we do this in a kind of rational, overarching, you know, uh, way that makes sense for the whole device. Um, so the, in the clear work wipe specific things and it also can send out like an emergency text message if you're um, pre-configured. Uh, then we have this upcoming app um, from a very, from a, uh, it's 
called Big Buffalo, which is a very secure RSS reader. We got some secure through syncing. Um, and so that has a built-in panic button. So it's the idea is the content you, it's for content in countries where you get in trouble just for reading this content. Like, uh, for, for this. example, um, in, in Tibet, there there are um, there are blogs. There there are blogs, you know, no, like just like Docker.com's a blog. But these blogs are very special because if you read them, you are in certain part, in, in parts of the world committing a crime. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of weird because it's like this sort of uh, it's, it's, it seems like this very like, uh, pedestrian activity, but in that context, uh, it's, an RSS reader is not really a pedestrian. Yeah, so that has a built-in panic button feature, and then we were just talking about, we have been trying to sketch out an architecture for how you could have like a centralized, like each app could have like a, you could register my panic function, and then you have like a centralized configure app where you could say like, well, when I hit panic, it's going to delete my contact and wipe my RSS feeder and send a text message to my mom, that kind of thing. And then, yeah, and that's, that's sort of the ongoing challenge, because then inevitably, if, if it's too easy, then oops, my phone's all gone. It's too hard, and I'm going to use it. Can you talk a little bit about if you showed the slide earlier that had like two phones? Is that something or two different devices? Like, or is it here for talking? I'm going. I don't know. You just look right past it. Oh, maybe we have a lot of slides. Uh, it said processor and baseband. Yeah. Oh. Um, we also said we weren't going to talk about baseband. <laughs> Uh, I mean, there's so much to talk about, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think we should segue into these two phones. Yeah. Oh. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I, I I really don't want to talk about these brands. Um, you Google. Um, uh, but it's like really scary. So uh, I so. Your phone tracks you all the time. <laughs> it's like more than your fingerprint. Um, but um, yeah. So and, and encryption. Oh. What the, the project that I'm working on specifically um, is called uh, is called the Open Secure Telephony Network, um, or OSTN, and then OSTEL is a uh, public test bed that um, that uh, was uh, an R&D project um, at its origin to prove that using exi existing open source software. Um, making peer-to-peer -peer secure phone calls on mobile handsets was possible, and it turns out that it is. Um, also, it turns out that that isn't really what most users care about. Um, you know, most users are looking for a Skype replacement. Um, Skype is uh, not. Uh, it does, I mean, it doesn't have the the best track record in terms of. Um, uh, Privacy, although they did release a transparency report for 2012, um, and because uh, Skype is separate from Microsoft in a corporate structure and based in Luxembourg, in the United States they have turned over no personal data about any of their US users, because they're not even in the US, which I didn't know until a couple of weeks ago. So that's kind of cool, but there's all sorts of like, you know, Skype's been the, the standard for a sort of de facto standard for such a long time. Um, there's a research project that was able to use an uh, uh, English dictionary and some linguistic analysis of an encrypted uh, audio stream between um, two, partic two participants in Skype and uh, get around 50% uh, plain text recovery. Um, so people are kind of you know, knocking at their, their crypto algorithms. Um, so people, like, there's a lot of... There's a lot of what? Oh yeah, and there's and there's backdoors uh, in China. There's Tom Skype, which looks like Skype, but is made, it's distributed by the Chinese government. It's official. Though. It's, it's official. a partnership. It's a partner. It's a they're BFF. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so and they're also adding in the U.S. Uh, there, there's this place known as Kalia, C A L E A, -A which is um, lawful oh, intercepts. Which is the rule that any telecom provider must provide a lost lawful interface system, which is basically an easy system for uh, law enforcement agencies to tap phones. Um, so Skype has not been had at Kalia. Right, because uh, Skype is not a long time. <coughs> right. So now Microsoft is adding that in. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's still, and so it's, you know, it's 2013, and, and like, VoIP's been around for a long time, but there's sort of a resurgence of, of voice as feature now, um, not so much as service. Um, so that's, well, so, so, um, so yeah, so, uh, uh, Ostel.me is a public service. Uh, the client is uh, oh right, yeah, it's, okay. that, uh, it's a it's a public service. Um, uh, right now, it's a closed system. It, uh, it, I mean, closed in the sense that you can only communicate with other users of Ostel.me. Um, you get uh, you get a private phone number. In this case, it's only four digits. Um, there's 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 uh, a couple hundred uh, hundred users right now. Um, um, so you know it's it's picking up uh, some momentum, uh, but the you know the, the goal uh, th this differs from a lot of the other Guardian projects um, uh, efforts because it's uh, uh, we're building infrastructure a little bit, um, but the you know the the, the the goal is more of like R and D proof of concepts and the infrastructure is there to show that it's possible, um, and uh, and and yeah and it is so if um, right now. Uh, if you uh, want to build your own secure phone server um, for your organization, big or small, um, I uh, uh, you could you could do so um, and run your own structure um, as well. And so so the uh, the security in uh, um, in Austel is um, in, the, in the client is called CRTP, um, and this is the extremely complicated protocol uh, description. Um, of, of how it works. Um, I'm using SIP as the signaling protocol, um, which is sort of uh, not really that fun to work with, but um, <coughs> it's kind of the most it's the most mature amount of software is you know speak SIP. Um, so one of the cool side effects of that is um, uh, Ostel.me is uh, supported by uh, uh, clients on Android phones, iPhones, Blackberries, Symbian phones. Basically, like any smartphone platform, uh, there there are some there there's a there's a big compatibility matrix because the client like we don't manage all of the client implementations, um, but uh, um, yeah, we do have the, the widest platform support for that. Um, is that? No, that's just sort of that's comparisons. Very high level. There's some comparisons about stuff, not necessarily void, um, but. <laughs> we, we, we clearly have practiced these um, but, uh, what else? Um, uh, so yeah, so, so, so um, the, the client, could you speak to the CSIP Yeah. Uh, the client is, um, um, there was, it turns out there was an existing uh, open source application called CSIP Simple, um, which has a, a fairly good developer community, um, uh, and uh, really like one, one maintainer who's the most active, um, and uh, it's pretty cool. Um, so I started um, looking into that, and um, now in the latest release um, in the Play Store of CSIP Simple, um, there is uh, all the security features are there, um, and there's a wizard um, that's sort of circled down there with a little Guardian Project logo called OSTN, um, and uh, if you use that wizard, you just have to you just, you do have to sign up for an account on another computer. This is in progress to make this easier. Um, You'll get a username and password, um, or a phone number and password. Plug it into that wizard, and anyone else in the system that you call, um, you get the first uh, um, the first try. They're also using CSIP Simple. You get this little uh, it's called an SAS, uh, short authentication string, um, and uh, uh, it uses uh, what's uh, what's called opportunistic encryption. In that, um, before the SAS is confirmed, the audio is in the clear. Um, you can talk to each other. Um, ideal, like the, the the theory being that if you, since you can talk to each other, you can transmit that SAS by something like C I E H. Um, yeah, we. we uh, Mike's mic's fine. We we're gonna do it live. <laughs> his, uh, yeah, we're, we're having some technical difficulties, but um, uh, essentially you would just like you know. You want to call me and I'll just fake it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just to see like, what the uh, right. The, so yeah, the user interaction is. It's a little. It's a little odd, so I'm, I'm calling Hunt and it's going ring, ring, ring. And I go, oh, it's Lee. Hi, Lee. Hey, uh, what's up? C I E H. And then I'm like, C I E H. All right, cool. Now we're. And then, and then <laughs> <laughs> you click OK. 
um, and, it, and it caches that string. Um, and then for all subsequent um, uh, uh, calls with the same user, um, you still get an SAS that you can optionally verify, um, but you don't have to do that manual verification. The idea being that if um, if the first time is middled, uh, or if the first time is not middled, then like the nth time, it's uh, <laughs> man in the middle, then the nth time is, uh, you know, it's like, the, the probability is so, so low that it's near zero. Um, so this is just kind of, the, the hardest part of encryption is like starting the kind of chain of trust, like uh, just encrypting something and sending it doesn't mean you're actually guaranteed to know that it came from that person. Um, so this is an interesting spin on that idea. And normally when you're doing this, you're like PGP, if you use PGP, uh, like I have this big PGP fingerprint, and then you go and you like look on your computer and you go ID 61 like that. It's a very laborious process. Um, so here it's this kind of, I mean, it's a little odd that you start phone calls by going C I E H or Z P N Q. Yeah. Um, There's another app that has a dictionary of English words, so you can be like, you know, like, um, I don't know. I, 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 the thing I just thought of, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> uh, but other than that part, the encryption is transparent. And so, it's kind of, it seems like a pretty good trade-off. I mean, from our point of view, we use it a lot in, internally, like making phone calls. Um, we yeah, have a member of our team who um, is what we call full paranoid. He used every, all of his work, his, his computer always uses Tor for everything. Um, he only like calls us on Mostel. Um, he uses a, he has his real identity, and then he has his guardian identity. Um, and he doesn't want those links, so he, that's why he keeps the, like the location. If someone can follow his location, then they can link this real identity. And he does this because he's um, he travels all over the world, um, in, and so it would be quite easy for him to be banned from traveling to countries for uh, working for Guardian. Party. So Nathan, our founder, is already already cannot get a visa to China. They know him. Yeah, and it makes sense because like they don't they tried. don't send you an email about that. <laughs> <laughs> so you just show up at the airport. You're like, <laughs> is it a failure to frequent flyer model? Yeah, you can't use miles to pay them off. It's um, it's apparently also very hard to get the U.S. government to tell you whether or not you're on the no fly list. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so is this sort of funded by the government? That one we haven't worried too much about. <laughs> partially, partially funded. Um, um, yeah, so, I was going to say something, oh no, about uh, different, like, just us usability and, like, just user testing that we've done around the world. You know, it's, it's telecommunication, so it carries all this baggage that isn't really around for typical, like, internet stuff. It's also synchronous, so high latency environments um, significantly affect the experience, uh, whereas, you know, HTTP stuff or, like, you know, asynchronous messaging doesn't really matter. Um, so there's all these sort of extra like problems, um, and um, because of the um, you know just like the, the privilege of working with the Guardian Project team um, uh, and a lot of that team being so geographically dispersed, I've been able to do a lot of tests um, in the form of like actual you know like calling people that I work with um, all, all over the world, uh, Asia, India, um, South Pacific, uh, Europe. Parts of Africa, um, and um, it's pretty good. Um, there's some delay. Um, you know, there, there's one of the uh, one of the, the um, engineering challenges with doing encrypted synchronous voice, like full duplex, um, so both people can talk at the same time. Um, is uh, is latency just in general? It's like you know, it's one of those hard problems. Um, so you get to compromise a little bit of, of latency um, uh, for that extra bit of security. Um, but what's also really cool about um, um, Austel and the CSIP Simple client um, that at this point in time sets it apart from a lot of other um, secure, uh, well, there really aren't that many other secure um, uh, like full, full, fully packaged services. Um, um, but uh, what sets uh, the Guardian projects apart is uh, Codec 2 um, is the name of a, what was an experimental codec, but has been um, uh, Kind of like nailed down and formalized, and is now available in the CSIP Simple plugin pack or codec pack, which is another uh, um, another thing that you can install via the Play Store. 
and that gives you access to codec 2, which lets you do synchronous voice um, at 2 kilobits per second, which is uh, it was designed by ham radio operators. So it's, it's fracking awesome. Um, and, um, and it's good, you know, it's like, it, it, in certain cases, um, it's, it's comparable to, to cellular carriers and stuff. Um, so you still get the latency, but, you know, you're, wherever you are, if you have like an edge data connection, and you're going around, like, you know, the Mediterranean or something. Um, okay, for comparison's sake, like, GSM, what's on your cell phone, is about 19 kilobits per second. This is 2 kilobits per second. So it's a tiny, tiny stream of that. Um, but understandable voice. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's really cool. And one of the, the key things, so we have Austel.me, which is running as our test bed, um, and Austel.co, which is launching tomorrow. Yeah, we're going to do and sort of, yeah, well, uh, which we're, we're going to put up the website tomorrow, so I guess that means it's soft launch. launching. Yeah. Uh, but a key part of this project is that there's also um, chef scripts for uh, the instances to, to there are chef scripts to install the whole uh, server. So these are the, the scripts that we use to set up our own instances. But a central part of this project is, um, you know, it's a lot of the same problem happens again and again with all of these um, these uh, secure uh, phone services, which is you have to trust the provider uh, because they have information about you. So they give you some of these new ones like Silent Circle. They can't see the content of your, of your um, they can't keep, uh, hear the content of your conversation, but they can see who's calling who and when. So in this which case, is quite a bit of information. Yeah. Totally. So you have to still trust the provider. So if we're saying, you, if you trust us, we have services you can use. If you don't, run your own. And, um, uh, oh, so just to, to clarify, Chef is a uh, configuration management automation framework. Um, and uh, you're talking to Nylog. <laughs> <laughs> I assume nothing. You, know, you may have heard of this, but what does it do? Um, it, it's it's cool, um, and and um, I have it down to the, the. It turns out that one of the hardest problems in this whole secure VoIP world is is that it's um, uh, was just the configuration, just figuring out what to turn on and turn off. Um, so I've automated a lot of that, and it, it sets up a certificate authority. Um, it does it does a bunch of stuff. Um, but in terms of infrastructure, so uh, yeah, and I'm talking to Nylog, so m many of you have probably seen a Raspberry Pi. Um, uh, so yeah, like if you don't trust your phone service, you could get one of these and put Debian on one of these and plug it into an in like a Ethernet connection that's on the internet and this. Uh, this will happily run uh, you know, thousands of concurrent users and calls um, securely. Um, and then, and also another important detail about um, um, Austel and just the overall, like you know, open secure telephony. Um, the, the server is not decrypting. The server is is, uh, is there um, almost exclusively, uh, uh, mostly to handle uh, networking problems. So it's proxying points, uh, all the bits. Um, your, your voice is a really hard thing to do on the internet because everyone's behind an app. Um, so that's that's why there's a there's a, there's one of the reasons it's a server. Also, user registration. Um, doing peer to peer decentralized user registration is a problem that I don't think anyone in the world has solved. But yeah, oh, and also what's that? There's there's this hosting company that will. Um, there's one in Austria and the Netherlands. Yeah, um, and we're, so you you put. Uh, whatever you want in this SD card, like the whole OS, and you know, make sure that it boots up with all the services you want running. Um, ship it to these dudes, um, or Austria. you ship in Austria, um, or <coughs> ship them the whole Raspberry Pi. If not, if you don't have a Raspberry Pi, it doesn't even matter. Like they'll, they'll sell you one, and they will host whatever is on this SD card um, for free. For free. Um, your IP address and your Raspberry Pi on the internet. So and that's one option. Of um, no, I don't think that cool. they don't want to hire people, so they just you have to mail something they can plug right in and be done with it. I think I think you kind of I think their tech support is mail back to you. So you should check, um, um, figure out what like the normal upstream bandwidth is and the size of your image, and then compare that to like international shipping time and see which one is faster. <laughs> um, and that's. 
I did point, I have my point to one last piece which I haven't really talked about yet, which is um, uh, this idea of kind of burner servers. Like here you have a cell phone server that costs you like, maybe forty dollars. So like burner is a term that people use for like cell phones, meaning like if you buy a phone to use and then if you like think you're being tracked, you throw it away and buy another. Um, so we, we we're into the idea of burner server. Um, so something that's so cheap and easy to set up that when if it gets compromised, if someone finds it physically, you just you throw don't care and you move it away, move on, you know. Um, and so RFI is one interesting way to do that. And we're also uh, looking at um, putting Debian on Android devices. So Android is the Linux kernel. Debian runs wonderfully with the, Android, uh, the Linux kernel. Um, so and it, so we have an app called uh, Little Debian, which is meant to make it really easy to install Debian on an Android phone. Um, there's a bunch of other ones out in the, there's I think about four in the Google Play Store. I was a little slow to get my name. It's been around for a while, but I just finally put it in the Play Store so you can get it there. Um, the difference between them um, is what my, this one, Little W, is quite focused on, uh, it's running it in a Cheroot. Um, it uses Dev Bootstrap to build up a Cheroot. It's also, um, as far as I know, it's the only one that actually uses the, uh, the whole, um, it has a whole chain of uh, verification and trust. So it, it includes the Debian keys in the, in the app. Um, the app itself is signed by us. So you have a um, chain of trust there via the Google Play Store. Um, then as little Debian is installing Debian, it already has the Debian keys. So you can verify all the packages that it's downloading. Uh, and as, as it's installing, using the standard, this is just the standard Debian way of verifying packages. Uh, and then I just recently added, it's pretty, it's a little raw, but um, the ability, it, it um, will generate a, a hash of your uh, Debian image and then check it every time it, um, it boots. So we want to make it so that it, we have a, a whole trusted chain of authority back to Debian and you know that the packages that you're getting are unmodified from Debian, and the whole install you're getting is, is trusted. So that's that's the as far as I know, the other ones and the other installers in the app store are not doing this. Um, and the other difference, I, from my experience, is that you can you launch the app, click the install button, and then you choose whether you want. Right now it's only Debian, but I hope to add it into it. So you. Launch it, and then you would just choose whether you want stable, old, stable, testing, or unstable. You choose the size of the image and the mirror. You hit install, and you'll have a working Debian um, true on your phone. So I try to make it just, or you don't even have to configure. You just take the default config, hit install, so you hit true twice, launch the app, hit install, hit the install on the configuration screen, and you have Debian running Android. And if not, it's a bug. In. <laughs> it's on GitHub, you can talk to him. Yeah, or fix it, it's on your patch. And more about on, on burner servers, which is like so cool. We don't have a slide for them because it's like, it's happening like right now. Um, um, and in addition to our pies, there's, um, there's all these uh, consumer devices that are around 50 to 60 US dollars. Um, that are the, They look like USB keys, but they're fully functional Android, or computers running Android. Um, one end is a USB port, the other end is an HDMI port, and that's it. And um, they're kind of in this... They have Wi-Fi. They have Wi-Fi, yeah. Um, and uh, one of the, the use cases is like home media stuff, so it's, it's on this... Uh, they're, they're trying, like com the companies that are distributing them are trying to figure out like what the hell they're going to do with these things. Um, but like, you know, so if they're running Android with Will Debbie, you can put Debbie on it, it will connect to the internet, and just sort of sit there, it looks like a USB key, so you could run any network service you want and throw it away if, you know, if shit gets real. I guess they should, it, do people, have people here heard of Tor hidden services? This is a key aspect of this. Um, okay, so I'll just quickly, so Tor, the anonymizing service, has this wonderful feature, um, if, uh, which is that you can uh, make what's called a hidden service, which basically gives you this a domain name uh, that's fixed, but it, it's mapped through the Tor space, so it doesn't matter where your computer actually is, as long as it has internet connection and it's running Tor. That domain name will always map to your server, and it will do it anonymously. 
So that's where this is a key aspect of the burner server, because so let's say you you take this little Wi-Fi dongle thing and you just find a place where you can plug it in and it has open Wi-Fi. You know, like on the edge of some building, like in, in a lamppost and the New York examples, you know, right next to Google open Wi-Fi. Um, and that you'll have an onion address, which is you know some large so like what, 30 characters of hex and then dot onion. Um, and wherever that little box is plugged in, it'll always have that same opinion address so that you get in fact domain name. It's totally crazy, and it's really easy to do to set up a torment service. I, I did it as an exercise just with a web server. Um, and it's crazy because like even if you're so so if if you have root on the server that's running the hidden service, um, like it it there's no web server listening on 480, like from the outside. But it's like serving web pages. Um, I think that kind of covers our yes. Yeah, yeah. okay. um, I don't think it's not in the app store, but it's you it's um GitHub. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, if anybody like a GPT email, which is like, you know, like big force ease of use. Um, then uh, uh, there's a client called Canning Mail. Um, we're also working on, uh, or have, Cordial, uh, right. GPG to okay. measure it. So APG right now is in the App Store. It's a Java, through Java implementation of PGP, which works with K9 right now for very rough PGP mail support. Uh, we have ported GNU PG, like the standard one is in, in you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, We ported it to Android, and now we're working on actually making it into an app. Right now you can run it in the command line in the Android, in the Android command. I assume you think that'll be ready. Well, right now you can run the commands on the command line. <laughs> so if you want to do that. Um, on your we, keyboard, you yes. like an app. You should, you so your app can call the command line by yeah. okay. And it, had, it handles the password for you. Um, we, it's, I, I, yeah, I started, I was like, oh, it'll be easy a long time ago. I'll do it in like two months. And then it was like, oh my god, it is not. 2PG, if anyone's looked at it, it's very common. It's like many different services and things like things talking to each other and creating protocols. Question all the way in the back. Uh, I'm just curious. I mean, like, so we're seeing like the proliferation of like all these cheap ARM and BIPs devices. Um, and you know, Raspberry Pi, Shiba Plum stuff, you know, you go uh, what do you think? Yeah. Your voice isn't loud enough. Um, said that. Um, you know, if you look at the proliferation, I mean, it's the ARM boards, the Beagle Bones, the Raspberry Pis, it's MIPS boards, and so on. And it's great in many ways. But, and then obviously, if you're expanding like the core network, for instance, there's more relays and more nodes in a public anonymity network, you know, with Orbot and, you know, onion browser and so on, onion, uh, whatever the, the oh, iOS one, onion browser? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. But it, it's all great and all, but it's really, I mean, and I won't form part of it in a small way, but it's a proliferation really quantity wise. And I feel like, you know, where are we going to be in five years with this stuff? I mean, what can we see? I mean, right now it's like kid for patent and arms race. Like, you know, country X blocks this board. So Tor goes, oh, let's act like we're Skype. You know, I mean, we're seeing this little kid for patent and arms race right now when it comes to circumvention and so on. Where are we in two years? Where do you guys speculatively think we're going to be in two years or three years on this? Okay, so Tor. That's I mean, it's a hard question because it really depends on where you are. And Tor in the U.S. works great. Like you can use it all over the place, and, it, it, and I think it's going to be relatively effective at, at anonymizing your traffic. Um, in the U.S., we don't really think about the government blocking. The government monitors; it doesn't block. Um, China does a lot of monitoring, and they're very, very good at blocking. Um, and they're winning. so right now it's very. For a while, Tor was winning, and you could get out the internet using Tor in China. Um, they have, China has a lot of smart people who want to work on this. They have a lot, they're putting a lot of money into it. And so they have a huge, and they have seven connections to the internet, each one that all go through <laughs> massive systems. And, um, and so they're really like the bleeding edge of this stuff. And it's, and then you have something like where Iran, or maybe, you know, this one of the recent examples of like Egypt. If a country, or Syria, if a country's willing to turn off the internet, you know, and then you have to go other other ways. Um, 
we, we work with some like mesh networking. And we're working with this group, uh, Commotion. So I've done uh, the, the, the Android app, um, which works. Unfortunately, actually, it's Google people here, maybe. <laughs> Lobbying for ad, uh, to add ad hoc support back into Android. Uh, so ad hoc Wi Fi has never really officially been in Android. Uh, it was unofficially in Android until 4.0. Um, and then they actually specifically removed it. Uh, because they were, they were, I guess it was causing crashes, and they were like, we don't need to support this, why is it there? Um, so there is some internal people here. Um, uh, Simon, I forget his last name. Uh, um, and then a guy, Lucas Dixon, um, a couple other people who are, are working at it. And it sounds like, I don't, so at this point I'm like cheerleading. It's like, we have the code. Um, we think it's great if it works. Now we just need to get actually get it into Android again. Um, and maybe, so why this is so important, ad hoc mode? One hand, you can do tethering, which is nice. But um, ad hoc mode is what's used in mesh networking. Um, so the big, kind of wide, uh, big, large scale mesh networking, like OLSR, that's like thousands of networks across cities, and Vienna, Barcelona, Berlin, places like this. Um, if when all Android devices have ad hoc mode, that means all of them can mesh network, and that means you can really quickly build internet replacements, which is um, super cool. So that's in the kind of the use case. Um, that's the use case of like someone turning off the internet, but also it means you can set all of your devices to the same Wi-Fi. So you just say the one we're using is commotionwireless.net. Um, and wherever you are, they'll talk to each other because they always mesh. So it means you don't have to um, think about changing configurations to have all your devices talk to each other over a regular IP. So there's the day-to-day -day nice usage. If, if one, and if whether one or not you have the nodes can go out the internet, then as long as you're on the mesh, you have the internet connection. Well, I by the And yeah. uh, Commotion Wireless said that's another one. Oh, that's our other So uh, I just want to mention, I think we're getting close to the, the, the end of the time. Yeah. I want to know if you prefer questions, uh, and well, that will work if there's a conclusion you want to go to, however you want, I just want to help uh, give the direction the last 15-20 uh, mm -hmm. uh, minutes probably before we wrap. It's cool, it's very cool. cool. <laughs> I mentioned it earlier. Like, we, we, o -O -N -I. O -O -N -I, O-O-N-I. The, the observation of, open observation of network interference, uh, but it's a, you know, to uh, uh, more more specifically address the question of like what's going what's going to happen in five years, um, you know, and, and I think as as uh, uh, people start, to, you know, globally are, are more sensitive to issues of censorship on the internet, uh, more as net neutrality debates continue. Um, one uh, one of the like Pune is, is is positioned in an interesting place because it's a uh, an open project to attempt to have a map of censorship on the entire internet and deliver uh, um, uh, facts about that via a REST API. Um, so you could write your own applications um, like an anti-circumvention tool, or let's say you want like you know to like whitelists or blacklists, but how do you figure out like what's allowed where? Or because some 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 network censorship is is. As, as, as naive as just like a blacklist saying like, you know, twitter.com denied. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so Uni is, is taking this kind of uh, from the outside in approach to modeling this really large part of the problem. Um, but there are physicists working on it, so we're good hands. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll have to say something real quick in conclusion and get more questions for you. So we're at Open Source Project, we're also funded, core team. Um, we are looking for all sorts of contributions. If you want to, we love just people, you, we want everyone to use these apps and tell us when they're broken. Anything from breaking the encryption to uh, usability, we want these things to be easy. Where's the code? Uh, GitHub slash Guardian Project. Thank you. Um, GitHub.com. <laughs> um, and so, and we also are, uh, um, recently, in the last year or so, I guess we did a good job in the first two years because we have a lot of projects and funded and not enough people to do them. So we're looking for Android programmers. Uh, easiest, we don't, none of us are full-time, so it's like contract-based. Um, 
or we always we always welcome volunteers as well. Um, and we're also looking for testing kind of net people who know how to um, uh, you know, network monitoring and, and that kind of thing. So we're part of the testing process to make sure that our anonymizing apps are actually doing the right thing. Um, and um, yeah, you get yeah. to do like cool stuff with Wireshark. And then in other ways, like we have a mailing list, um, there's a Twitter feed, all this kind of stuff. And and we welcome all uh, contributions, including non-technical. We want to know if you know of certain use cases or people that um, should be using these tools. Uh, we, we also conduct training and things like that. Um, and if one thing is also quite important to do is uh, if discussing the ethical issues of this, because we are talking about tools that and hide communication. And these are tools that can be used for bad and good. And so what we try and do, we try and make the tools neutral, but we try and uh, promote them and teach them in a way that it's, the good is going to outweigh the bad. Um, and this is something that is an ongoing process. It's, it's, it's difficult to do, I think. Um, and so feedback, criticism, comments, flames, all that. Um, That's why I really like Jake's right to read. The internet's a communication network, and the internet's now in everyone's hands at all times, or where on their eyes. Um, if, you're, if you were lucky enough to get one of the Google Glasses from the awards contest, um, that, uh, that yeah, I mean, it's like it's it's uh, it's your your right to access information. And, and it's, you know, I think the global community of of activists and lawyers and policy you know, programmers and hackers and stuff that are working on this information as a, is a, as a human right problem. I mean, it's like, that's kind of one of the sort of high level positions we're coming from is that it's a human right to access. But that it's not, like, you know, the UN does not have that written down yet. But, you know, maybe in five years they will. So, so maybe, if I, I see one question over there, maybe uh, three more questions, then we'll go back there. And, okay, that's two, and then we'll go for the third question. So you were, you were, um, you were earlier. Are there any projects that deal with scrambling? <coughs> what? That deal with scrambling on the voice so that secure communication can happen even without internet access? You mean, uh, <coughs> what do you mean scrambling? Well, you're just using regular cell phone to, to make oh, a voice so on it and identify. So, we weren't going to talk about baseband. <laughs> but, uh, um, well, you know, because there's microphones and those baseband microphones. Um, so if you're if you're on your if you're doing voice over your carrier's network, um, your carrier will have access to your voice, whether the um, like you know user land uh, um, um, software on the, on the smartphone uh, knows it or not. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, that, no, I'm not working on that. Um, the I, I, it's, it's way easier to just circumvent the carrier networks for voice and just say like we're we're just using data. Um, but uh, we, we I'd have like to know more about it because it's kind of a we have uh, so in the, in the voice <laughs> like the voice call scenario is like what you said is pretty hard to circumvent. Um, so in, when you get into voice over internet, then you can just encrypt and anonymize. But where this kind of thing is actually useful and we've explored is in um, in, in videos. So in the same way that you want to redact a face. We also want to um, uh, be able to make it so that voices are not identifiable in a video that you're public, uh, publicly posting. So we have a um, part of Informacam is a, a sound redaction plugin. So you can either just chop the sound out, uh, or you can um, downsample it to basically kind of robot voice category. Um, it's what? It's shaking your head. <laughs> uh, to, I mean, it's a very simple technique. You just basically take every 20th bit of the voice and you get, you're get you just removing the data. So uh, the tricky point is making it a balance of intelligibility and but not identifiability. Um, so we've done some stuff with it. We've experimented. We've had like informal tests where I'm like paying, playing speeches by famous people and trying to see if people can identify, see if they can understand what the speech is saying but not tell who the person speaking is. And we had pretty good people didn't identify JFK and George Bush. So I think those are two George W. Bush, two two identifiable voices. But not really a big sample set. Does that answer your question? Well, uh, is 
more from a point of view to prevent somebody from listening to the conversation rather than right. yeah. to listen. Okay. I suppose it would be possible, but if you're worried about kind of state interference, then they yeah. they can get to the point where uh, of turning on baseband microphones, maybe. I mean, maybe that's a little paranoid, but. Yeah, that's a little paranoid. But I also like. <laughs> Carrier network. But possible. If, if you're, yeah, it's totally possible. Um, uh, and carrier, carrier. If we're doing voice over a carrier network, they have call detail records um, of exactly what happened, whether the the, the, the conversation is intelligible or not. Um, in some cases, it doesn't even matter. Um, yeah, actually, William Binney, the NSA whistleblower, talked a lot about that. He didn't. He didn't need the content in the messages, just based on metadata. You can tell, you know, you can tell very clearly who, you, who your social circle is, who you're working with, and so in that situation, you're hearing a voice. But once over one phone call, you're not getting much information. But over a pattern of a year, you have this whole map based on metadata. So it's it would be, it, be hard to do in a limited use. But if someone wants to try it, you can just see. Wait, so, wait, so, talking so, about hand docs? So um, two, two, two more questions. I'll, I'll get if you want to. I'll just go over there and then call it. You have a question? So just to rewind to the encrypted VoIP, I know you said you use the RTP, which memory serves you said Debbie Island agreement for the keys. Where do you store the keys securely without root access? Because I can see like other applications being able to access the keys and the malware that's intended to access the keys and then send them to third parties to decrypt the conversation. That could be the problem. Uh, so, so the, the key, the, yeah, you're you're right. Uh, uh, the Diffie Hellman algorithm is used for uh, for key negotiation, um, but that happens on on uh, first call with someone. So, so the so there aren't the keys um, um, necessarily um, in that the keys the, the keys are negotiated the first time you talk to someone and then they're cached. And I can't speak to any details lower than that level because I don't know them. But it, yeah, in terms of the ca the caching would be the story of the keys that you're talking about. But because the uh, the identification process is so easy, first you do it by if you recognize the person's voice, um, and then the other is that you're reading the string to each other, and that's what the protocol is based on. Right, but someone could still man in the middle attack that, and then you yeah, no, yeah, it's, I mean, no, I don't think so. That's I don't know the details of the protocol, but really it's all based on reading that string. I, I think the question is, what happens if you make an initial call and then later your phone is compromised, and then you make a second right. call? You'll so each time, if you, if you say that for the way the protocol is designed, zero to be, you make the if you confirm those four letters, then it's it's not using a stored key. There's so a, there's that's a key, that's the shared secret. Yeah, I don't know the details of it. I'm not a yeah, the, but that's, that's the key to look into. Is that ZRTP is re recommended that you don't store anything, and you base the identification based on that uh, uh, four letter. Yeah, it's kind of it's, it's yeah one time pad. That's it. It's, it's a good metaphor. And rekeying um, OTR has the same uh, issue, um, or not issue, but like that does the same thing. Like each time it, you could you you could rekey like whenever you want. Like the, the private keys in the sense aren't really that valuable. It's not like PGP where it's like that's the one. Um, it's just you know. It's, it's kind of yeah inverse of the way it was. It's kind of inverse. Yeah. Yeah. Read about it. I don't know it that well, but okay. it seems to be well vetted. One more question? Yeah, we have one more question right here. The uh, uh, question I had was about the metadata. Um, I know you, you're kind of hesitant to talk about these things, but were you referring to the same service that Amdocs provides, where they use metadata to figure out the associated with that? No, Amdocs. Amdocs. A M D O C S. I've never heard of it. I don't know that. I mean, maybe you could explain who it is, and then we can uh, see if we can do anything. Um, long story short, um, they're basically, you know how telephone companies provide a service for telephones? Mm -hmm. They're the ones that handle the billing for all the telephone companies in North America. So it doesn't uh, okay. matter if you're IBM or, let's say, another three-letter organization. They pretty much can figure out who's who just by looking at the metadata, and I was wondering if you could expand on that. Uh, you're keeping all the call detail records. Oh, I see. I mean, yeah, there's tons and tons of systems like that. If you just want to about, talk about, like, if you're curious about ways that we are being tracked. Right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, if, I don't know how widely known this is, but if you have a GSM or CDMA radio, then tell 
the telecom knows the location and logs the location of that very often. They have, and they store that data for a long time, six months to a year. Um, so you might think, well, do I really care that the telecom knows my location all the time? Um, and then if, if, if you, you know, I go back to the source that I heard it from best, which is with William with the NSA whistleblower, is that you, the content is, is actually not that important when you have mass amounts of metadata. So if you look at, if you just say you have mass amounts of phone locations uh, over uh, time, so you have many samples a day for millions of people, and they are now well-tested algorithms for mapping all this stuff together. And so you can imagine, you see this phone, it goes to a certain location sometime in the evening, stays there until sometime in the morning, does that most nights, and you have a pretty good chance that that's that person's home address. Um, it, you can see phones that are in proximity of each other, and you can see the time and, and location of where these phones are in proximity of each other. You know, the coworkers, you know, the friends, um, and on and on and on. So, the, having the, the reason why this is particular, particularly bad with cell phones is because there is a hard-coded built-in unique IP to your radio. Um, and so, they don't need to know your phone number. They don't need to know any other identification about it. They have this unique ID and they can look at location of it all the time. <coughs> Wi-Fi is a little different because you don't have that unified network view. Um, that's one part of it. So if you're using like just Wi-Fi, you're, you're, it's going to be a lot more different providers. It's also quite. Um, it's uh, there isn't a globally exposed unique identifier um, in the terms of like a, a MAC address is what it serves at. But people in the far end see your IP address. They don't see your MAC address. There's no central authority that always sees your MAC address in Wi-Fi. Um, and there's also most Wi-Fi hardware, you can change the MAC address to whatever you want. And if you're running Debian, you can install MAC changes. And every time you connect, you can get a different MAC address. So in that situation, um, using Wi-Fi, uh, it's much harder to build this kind of image of it. It's much harder to get metadata over time. Um, there's other ways that it's done it. So like, there's a, in Android, there's a unique ID that we use um, to tie the, uh, identity, and so when you're using, say, Google services, um, they will have this kind of map. Google will have this kind of map of, of every time you are logging into a Google service, or maybe, I guess, a Google um, uh, So, I, mean, I go into this, yeah. So, um, my approach has been, for a number of reasons, that I actually don't use uh, CDMA or uh, GSM. A lot of people say I don't have a cell phone, <laughs> but I have a thing that rings and I put it to my head and call me on the phone. It has voice features. <laughs> yeah. uh, but actually, uh, this was made a lot easier by Google because they use Google Voice for text messaging. Um, so I do have some of the tracking there. Um, so, yeah. Um, why don't we wrap up and do the wrap up here? We have uh, three book vouchers and we have one book up here. And um, you guys have your questions ready? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Alright, so what we're going to do is this. Um, raise your hand, I'll come over to you with the mic. And um, it's easier if I can see you. If you guys want to participate, uh, you don't have to, it's okay. But uh, I have a bad tendency that the first the hands I'll see are going to be right around here. So, uh, so uh, anyways, raise your hand when you know the answer, and I'll come over to the first person I see. Oh, did I see the question? Shoot. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, what? Program is used to build the Debian install in Google Debian. Oh. <laughs> you don't want to make a code then. Bootstrap? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Why don't you pick your, pick your, uh, pick your choice of things? Yes, we have a book here or. Not the laptop. <laughs> 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 but, um, this book. Keep an eye on that Raspberry Pi. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'll, 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 you have to go hard. I'll go now. I'm going to go hard. I don't know. I guess. Huh. So something, something you spoke about. All right. I'll go 
not, not the hard ask. Um, so what's, uh, uh, there's a, there, the, there, the answer to this was in the slide, if you're paying attention, you can not actually really know the answer, but just simply like, memorize the slide. Um, but, uh, so what's the name of the uh, person that can go in between two parties that are conversating? <laughs> Put your hands up and keep them up. He's, uh, so I head over here. Material and still continue to receive a result at the other end. Will you yeah. accept that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure what you should tell me. That's cutting edge. Uh, there you go. It's cutting edge. I don't even think All it's right. possible right now to solve the other one. Small art. Thank you very much, everybody. So, remember this. We can get the hospital ready and we're going to. Um, uh, uh, we can do this because it's another place. We can have a spot over on uh, 14th, just off of 8th. Um, we'll be leaving you guys down, so hang out of here and we'll start going out of groups. Oh, wait, we had an event. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we are going to be doing a uh, open uh, workshop uh, hack session on. Um, the, the Cypher Suite, so SQL Cypher, Ohio Cypher, um, NetCypher, on uh, June 6th, the evening of June 6th at New York City. And if you want to secure your Android app, come on down and I'll help you get started. Where is it again? New York City, it's on, uh, like, it's on Broadway just south of Canal, it's a co working space. It will be there June 6th, the evening, so probably starting at 6. And uh, we will post information, more information on the website. All right, we just confirmed it. Go ahead and talk about it.